Number 1. Jirin was last seen sleeping in his bed on the second floor of his home on 40th Street in Irvington, New Jersey at 1 a.m. on June 23, 2002. He disappeared in the early hours of the morning while his teenage sister, Lalissa Harris, was watching television downstairs with her boyfriend, Gregory Jones McRae. The family searched the house before reporting Jirin's disappearance to police at 5 a.m. Jirin lived with his grandmother and eight other people, including Lalissa, at the time of his disappearance. He had been taken from the home of his mother, Janet Harris, on May 31, after she was arrested on charges of abusing him. Janet was still in police custody at the time her son disappeared. The charges against her were dropped after his disappearance, as it was determined that Jirin could have sustained his injuries as a result of his bone condition, rather than from abuse. Authorities do not believe Jirin was taken by either of his parents. It is also unlikely that he wandered away from the home due to the broken leg which limited his mobility and due to the fact that he has not been found. Police have stated that Jones McRae has not been cooperative in the investigation. He has not been charged in connection with Jirin's disappearance, however. Jirin's four-year-old cousin, who shared a bedroom with him, says a Caucasian man and an African-American man abducted the child. Jirin's parents do not believe he was abducted, however, Janet believes there was an accident in the home that night and Jirin disappeared as a result. Most of the people in Jirin's house the night he vanished have not been ruled out as suspects in his disappearance, but there is little evidence available in his case. His case remains unsolved. Number 2 Lorraine left her new job at Microcircuit Corporation at 4 p.m. on March 9, 1979. She was a lab technician and had been working there for only a week. A co-worker dropped her off at the corner of Beverly Rancocas Road and Holly Lane in Westampton Township, New Jersey, less than a mile from her home in the 10 block of Whitlow Drive in Mount Holly, New Jersey, so she could walk the rest of the way. Lorraine's mother had offered to drive her to the bank to cash her paycheck after she arrived home. She was last seen at 5.15 p.m. while en route to her house. She apparently never arrived there, but her purse was found in the front yard. Her car was also at home, she wasn't driving it as she didn't have her license yet. Lorraine dropped out of Burlington County Vocational and Technical School in her junior year. She had been engaged to be married, but she broke up with her fiancé at Christmas in 1978. She liked her job and she was looking forward to getting her driver's license. Investigators don't believe she left of her own accord since she left all her belongings behind at home, including her paycheck. On the day of her disappearance, her mother was supposed to take her to the bank so she could open her own bank account. Investigators interviewed Lorraine's family members, friends and ex-boyfriends, but all of them were cleared from suspicion, and the authorities couldn't determine any reason why someone would want to harm her. After her disappearance there were persistent rumors that she was murdered and her body dumped at a local construction site. Police were never able to substantiate the stories, however. They have a person of interest in her disappearance, but this individual has never been charged due to lack of evidence. Lorraine's case remains unsolved. Her family now lives in Alabama. Number 3 Mark was last seen at approximately 4 p.m. near his family's home on Sunray Road in rural Del Haven, New Jersey on November 25, 1991. His mother allowed him to observe firefighters extinguishing a small brush fire a quarter of a mile from their house. Mark's mother left the residence to run an errand that would have normally taken five minutes, but she became delayed and as a result, she did not get home until 40 minutes had passed. Mark had disappeared by the time she returned home, his mother assumed he was with neighborhood children at the time. Mark has not been heard from again. He was reported missing at 5 p.m. that evening. The afternoon of his disappearance, traffic was rerouted past his house. There are unconfirmed witness reports that Mark was seen at a local park entrance with an unidentified child around 3.40 p.m. the day he vanished. The identity of the girl has never been determined. She was about 9 or 10 years old in 1991 and had dishwater blonde hair. She was about 4 feet tall, weighed approximately 70 to 75 pounds, and was wearing a three-quarter length dark blue ski parka with a hunter orange stripe on the back. Authorities believe the girl could have important information about Mark's disappearance. A sketch of the girl is posted with this case summary. Mark was possibly sighted with two other males on the day of his disappearance. One is described as between 30 and 35 years old, about 5'8", 5'9", tall and 150 pounds. He had dark reddish-brown hair and a ponytail and a generally scruffy, unkempt appearance. A sketch of this man is posted with this case summary. There is no sketch or description for the other man. 
Investigators did locate Mark's left shoe, a hand-me-down LA gear sneaker, at Sunray Beach approximately 75 yards from the family's home later in the day of his disappearance. His footprints were also seen above the tide line, but these were the only solid clues ever found. Mark lived with his mother and older brother at the time he disappeared and was a sixth grader at Cape May County Alternative Middle School. Thomas Bukovic Jr. was named as a person of interest in Mark's disappearance in 1993. He resembles the sketch of the man Mark may have been seen with. In 1993, a male prostitute approached the police and said Bukovic, one of his regular clients, had shown him a video of himself having sex with a young boy who resembled Mark. The boy was handcuffed, gagged and appeared frightened. The prostitute said he asked Bukovic if the boy was Mark Heimbaugh, and Bukovic said he was. He also said he deliberately planted Mark's sneaker on the beach to confuse the investigation. Butkovic has never been charged in Mark's case, but he has been imprisoned multiple times for drug offenses and for sex with underage males. In 2015, authorities asked anyone who knew Butkovic in the late 1980s and early 1990s to contact them. Investigators believe Mark was abducted by a stranger. His case is unsolved. Number 4 Jargoski was last seen at his residence on Homestead Road in Upper Township, New Jersey on February 8, 2008. He called his mother at 2.30 a.m. to say the house was on fire, but he was afraid to call the police because he thought they might accuse him of setting the fire. His home was in foreclosure and due to be sold at a sheriff's auction in a few weeks. Jargoski's mother hung up and called 911 herself. By the time firefighters arrived at the scene, the house had already burned to the ground. Jargoski lived alone at the end of a dead-end street, some distance from his neighbors. One neighbor coming home at 2.30 a.m. recognized Jargoski walking down the road with an unknown man. They said hello to each other, and Jargoski and his companion walked away towards Narrows Road, in the opposite direction of the fire. This is the last time anyone heard from him. Authorities searched the rubble thoroughly, but could find no evidence that Jargoski perished in the house fire. The cause of the blaze has never been determined, but it's considered suspicious. Jargoski was born in Cape May County and had lived there his entire life. He is a self-employed excavator, has one son and was in the process of a divorce at the time of his disappearance. His mother stated he was getting his finances together and had signed an agreement of sale for his home just hours before the fire, this would have stopped it from being auctioned off. Since he went missing, he hasn't used his debit card or cellular phone. Although he has no history of leaving without warning, authorities and Jargoski's family believe he may have left of his own accord. The circumstances of his disappearance are unclear. Number 5 Randy was last seen in Newark, New Jersey on August 20, 1978. He was with four friends, Michael McDowell, Melvin Pittman, Ernest Taylor and Alvin Turner. The five teens played basketball in West Side Park that evening, then got into a pickup truck driven by Lee Anthony Evans, a local carpenter who often hired them for odd jobs. Evans said he dropped the boys off at 11 p.m., Randy and his friends have never been heard from again. Authorities believe they disappeared from the area of Clinton Avenue and Fabian Place. Several days after the disappearances, one of the boys' mothers got a phone call from someone who claimed he knew their whereabouts and would tell her for $750. The call was traced to a payphone at Union Station in Washington, D.C. Police went there to investigate, but by the time they arrived the caller was gone. This individual has never been identified, and it is unclear whether he actually knew anything about the cases. Police believed the boys had run away, but their family members all said this was uncharacteristic of their behavior. Michael had a minor police record from being involved in a fistfight, but Randy, Melvin, Ernest and Alvin had never been arrested. All of them except Michael lived in Newark and were students at Wequahic High School, Michael had recently moved to East Orange, New Jersey. Many of the missing teens' relatives are now deceased. Their social security numbers haven't been used since they went missing, and none of them has applied for a driver's license in any state. In March 2010, Evans and another suspect, Philander Hampton, were charged with five counts of murder and arson in the missing teens' cases. Photos of Evans and Hampton are posted with this case summary. Authorities stated there was a third suspect, Maurice Woody Olds, but he died of natural causes in 2008. The three men were cousins. Evans had been a suspect in the case at the beginning, but he passed at least one polygraph test, and the case went cold for decades, owing to lack of evidence. It wasn't until a witness came forward in 2008 that the police were able to make progress in the investigation.
Investigators believe the five teens were killed because Evans and Hampton thought they'd stolen marijuana from them. The men allegedly took the boys to an unoccupied house in the 200 block of Camden Street, forced them inside at gunpoint, restrained them, locked them in and set the home on fire. The house burned to the ground and the fire spread to adjacent residences. Authorities do not know where the bodies are. They searched the site of the former Camden Street residence with ground-penetrating radar but found no evidence of human remains. In August 2011, Hampton pleaded guilty to five counts of felony murder. He claims Evans orchestrated the crimes and stated stated the boys were confined to a closet and the closet door was nailed shut. He agreed to testify at his cousin's upcoming trial. Hampton was sentenced to 10 years in prison for this role in the crimes. Going by 1978 sentencing and parole guidelines and taking into account the time he's already served awaiting trial, he could be released from custody in less than a year. He will also be given $15,000 after his release to assist with his relocation. Hampton testified against Evans at the latter's trial in November 2011, he was the star witness. Evans defended himself and presented few witnesses. There was no physical evidence to link him to the crime, and Hampton is a career criminal and drug addict. Evans was acquitted of all charges against him. Foul play is suspected in the teen's disappearances due to the circumstances involved. Number 6 Jones was last seen in Penns Grove, New Jersey, shortly before midnight on April 18, 2002. She was last heard from at 1 a.m. the following day, when she had a telephone conversation from her apartment in Mullica West Apartments in Harrison Township, New Jersey. When her brother became concerned and went to the residence to check on her, he discovered the front door to her apartment was open. Jones has never been heard from again. Foul play is suspected in Jones' disappearance, authorities have classified it as a homicide. She left behind her keys and purse, and also her two-year-old daughter, and her family says she was a dedicated and enthusiastic mother, and it would be uncharacteristic of her to abandon the child. Jones' parents believe her child's father, Mark S. Goodson, was somehow involved in Jones' disappearance. Her relationship with him began when she was 15 and was reportedly troubled, she once sought refuge from him in a women's shelter and had tried to keep him from finding out her home address. Goodson was later imprisoned for unrelated child molestation and drug charges. He denies any involvement in Jones' case. A previous girlfriend of Goodson's was murdered, and her naked body was dumped in Alloway Creek in Quinton, New Jersey in 2000. That crime is unsolved, and authorities are not certain if it is related to Jones' disappearance, but Goodson claims he is the prime suspect in both cases. Police searched the Alloway Creek area after Jones vanished, but found nothing pertaining to her case. Jones grew up outside Woodstown, New Jersey. She was studying for her GED and living with her daughter when she disappeared. She has been known to frequent Salem City, New Jersey. Her case remains unsolved. Number 7 Camp left his residence in Oakland, New Jersey on July 6, 1981, for a vacation in Canada. He drove his 1980 brick brown Chevrolet pickup truck on the excursion. A photo of the vehicle is posted at the end of this summary. Camp's family received correspondence from him until July 11, five days after he departed. On July 13, he called his parents and said he was in Mount Vernon, Washington, and going to cross the border into Canada. This was the last time anyone heard from him. That same day, $500 in Camp's traveler's checks were exchanged for Canadian currency at a bank in Richmond, British Columbia. The bank was only 15 miles north of the border and would have been the first bank a person encountered after crossing. Investigators learned that Camp's pickup truck had been involved in a traffic accident on July 27. An unidentified person was driving the vehicle at the time and impersonated Camp during the course of the traffic incident. Both Camp and an impersonator had cashed several of Camp's traveler's checks from July to October 1981. Camp's pickup truck was located in a Montana ravine on October 29, 1981, three months after he initially disappeared. The vehicle was abandoned and there was no sign of camp for anyone else at the scene. He has not been seen since 1981. There has been no report about anyone continuing to impersonate him.